Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Psalms Bible Study. It's a joy to be with you here as we continue our look at uh, working our way through the Psalms. And today we just have two Psalms. They're a little longer ones, uh, Psalms 68 and 69. Um, Psalm 68, uh, again, you can see it's for the choir director by David, a psalm, a song. And this is one of those psalm songs you know with those two descriptions of it uh been a series of them and those have all been more joy filled and temple festival like music especially this one it's appropriate for a temple festival and um the title that our editors gave it is the procession of god and uh what does it describe a procession of god from from mount sinai and so where the Ark of the Covenant was constructed. And so we're gonna have some history here all the way to the temple on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, uh, where the Ark found its home there. And first of all, in the tabernacle, and then yes, later in that temple that uh, Solomon made. So in some way, David is, is describing the entrance of the Ark at times uh, in the tabernacle at Jerusalem. And then also when it mentions the temple, he's looking ahead a little bit into, into Solomon's life. And um, so with those introductory words, um, Carol, would you mind starting us out with uh, reading verses one through six of Psalm 68? Sure. Judgment on God's enemies. May God arise, may his enemies scatter. May those who hate him flee from his presence. As smoke is blown away, may you blow them away. As wax melts before the fire, may the wicked perish before God. Blessing on God's people. But the righteous rejoice and celebrate in the presence of God. They will be happy and joyful. Sing to God. Make music to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord. Celebrate before him. In his holy dwelling, God is a father for the fatherless and a judge who defends widows. God causes the lonely to dwell together as a household. He leads out the prisoner with music, but the rebellious dwell in a scorched land. Right, so as this, this uh, starts out here in verse 1, thank you for reading, Carol. We had, may God arise, may his enemies scatter, may those who hate him flee from his presence. Um, you probably aren't familiar with it, but uh, it goes back to Numbers 10.35 when those almost exactly the same words uh, were shared by Moses. Uh, it was a prayer recited whenever Israel moved camp in the wilderness. Uh, and, and the ark led the way. Um, interesting that you, the nuance of the Hebrew, Numbers chapter 10 uh, has it translated, uh, the Hebrew has to be translated may, uh, the word, so a wish, a prayer uh, for the future. Um, here, the Hebrew, while our editors and translators still use the word may, the Hebrew here in Psalms uh, could be translated with uh, and as an affirmation of faith. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that here, verse one, while our, our translators did say, may God arise, um, and a, another appropriate translation would have been, God will arise. And uh, we, we have that because uh, as Moses is, is saying the prayer as they're in the wilderness, it's a prayer for the future, like get, get them to get the ark and the temple and the people to the promised land. Um, now David's looking back on that uh, event and, and looking with confidence to the future. Um, and we share that, that confidence of, of God's final victory. Uh, any questions or comments there on, on that connection to, uh, to Numbers 10, uh, just there in verse 1? It really opens up the whole, the whole part to uh, the whole topic of the psalm. Uh, by letting us in on what that history is. Uh, Sue, did you have a question? Or? Uh, no, I just didn't realize I was not on yet. Sorry. That's yeah, easy, easy to do. So then verses three through six continue that, and we get into uh, um, you know, some, some of the specific things that let us see 
uh, the the walk through the wilderness, right? The the song to him who rides through the deserts, um, and that uh, we have a disaster, the wicked perishing like wax. Um, but how is God to his family, to his children? He, he's a gentle father. Uh, we we have special note of the orphan, uh, the widows, the the poor, the lonely. Um, and then yeah, God God has a special place in his heart for for those people who who have no physical strength to help themselves. And, and um, like Martin Luther said, when we realize who we are, we're really all beggars. And so when we realize how much we need him, we can so much equate to the poor, uh, to the widow, to the, to the orphan, to the lonely. Um, we, we then also have that, uh, that reference to prisoners, um, prisoners may be uh, literal prisoners or, or the figurative spiritual symbolic prisoners of sin, um, but uh, the gospel again delivers, delivers all uh, prisoners as well. Uh, questions or comments on, on that section, uh, getting us into the, that blessing of, of God's people. Sue, would you mind taking that next section with reading verses 7 through 10? God brings his people into his land. Sure. God, when you went out in front of your people, when you marched through the wasteland, the earth shook. Yes, the heavens poured down rain. Before God, this one from Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. You dispersed plentiful showers, O God. You strengthened your inheritance when it was weary. Your people settled in it. Your, in your goodness, you provided for the oppressed, O God. Okay, so yeah, here, here very, we, we see some very specific things related to the march through the, through the wilderness, right? Uh, that the ark always went in front of his people and, and the, through the wilderness or the waste, wasteland as well, wandering in the desert. Um, and when did the earth shake, right? Uh, well, especially there at Mount Sinai, uh, that happened. Um, and, and the heavens poured down rain, uh, had more picture of that. Uh, we don't have, from my memory, any events in the wilderness where the rain poured down, um, but uh, definitely did when as droughts ended once they did arrive in the promised land in the days of judges. Um, and but God did give them give them their water to drink by opening wells and, and different things the plentiful showers, um, and, and the the inheritance that He strengthened when it was weary, um, you know what is the inheritance He gave to all the children of Israel that that promised the Messiah is coming, and, and when Israel was weary about keeping the keeping itself intact, God God made sure that it continues uh, so. The general principles here, uh, these are God's care for his people. And, and um, we, that was those general principles and those blessings in those opening verses, what I just covered, 7 to 10, uh, very specific historical situations. And, and those specific situations are going to continue. Um, yeah, the blessings from Mount Sinai all the way to Canaan. Um, and it's not just a historical review. Notice uh, the comment here on the side that that providence of God as he led Old Testament Israel, it's a model for the way he provides for his people through all time. He may do it with that spectacular miracle the, the earth shook, um, but he might do it with quiet providence, just giving us the, the natural rain that, that we need. He, he provides that as well. So any questions, comments uh, in, on these picturesque words here, verses 7 through 10? Um, Niles, could you continue then here with verse 11, that the Lord defeats the kings of the land? Seven, 11 to 14. The Lord provided the message. The women who, who proclaimed it were a great army. Kings with armies flee, they flee. The woman who stays home shares in the plunder. Even while you lie among the campfires, the wings of a dove are sheathed with silver and its feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered the kings there, it snowed on Zelman. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
so we have some some interesting uh, progressions and and um, the women singing and while while in general you can picture the the women singing uh, uh, as a typical thing when when the men return home from battle uh, the women come out to meet them in song uh, but uh, the reference to women also can take us back to the the days of Deborah the judge and even the song that that she sang um, and how how, how that uh, happened and and Sisera was the 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 enemy king in the days of Deborah and he was defeated and one of the interesting things about the women woman who stays home sharing in the plunder in the song that Deborah sang about defeating Sisera her song included a reference to to Sisera's mother uh, and he said oh where is Sisera where, where is my son oh he must be he's delayed in coming home because there's extra plunder for him to get. So she's singing about how her son is getting the plunder when really uh, all of his army lie dead on the battlefield and he lay dead uh, after he had tried to escape. Um, so there's an irony here that God's people divide the plunder when it was actually the enemies of God's people to take the plunder and, and all of their treacherous attacks. So it's really a, an interesting play on, uh, on the words there. Uh, verse 13 is a little bit difficult to, to, to translate or understand if you look at commentaries. Um, you know, even while you lie among the campfires, it's kind of talking about those people who maybe stayed to guard the supplies. Uh, they didn't go fight in battle, but they stayed in the, in the, uh, the camp. Um, it also could even be a reference to uh, an event that happened with Reuben at one time. The, the tribe of Reuben, Reuben stayed back and, and decided they didn't want to fight in, uh, in the battles in the promised land. And, and what does it say even about those who stayed among the supplies? Well, they shared in the plunder. That's probably what the, the words about the wings of a dove indicate. Uh, the wings of a dove, maybe a reference to the women again, sheathed in silver, feathers with yellow gold. But the silver and the gold and, and the whole context here just gets us to thinking that this does include um, some manner of Israel such, having such a big defeat of their enemies that they have the plunder to share in. Uh, anybody have any idea where Zalman is? Look at the notes. Um, Zalman uh, is, it, there's, there's a Mount Zalman that's in Samaria, but then there's also uh, in northwest of the Sea of Galilee in, in the land known as Bashan, um, that kind of more wild land, uh, Zalman is there. And because of the next section, it's probably not the, the Zalman in, uh, in, in Samaria. Uh, it's probably the one in, in Bashan that's mentioned there in verse 15. Uh, literally, it means black mountain. So with that you know, kind of a transition, it gets us right into that next section. Um, let's see, Carol, would you mind reading that uh, verses 15 through 18? Sure. <clears throat> the Lord makes his dwelling in Zion. The mountain of Bashan is a mountain of God. The mountain of Bashan is a mountain with many peaks. All mountains with many peaks why do you look jealously at the mountain God desires for his home? Indeed, the Lord will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. Among them the Lord has come from Sinai into his sanctuary. You ascended on high, you led captivity captive. You received gifts among men, so that even among the rebellious, the Lord God might dwell. Okay. So, some uh, difficult words to translate in the Hebrew here, and especially verses 15 to, to 17. But, um, but the, the picture, I think, we, we have very clearly. That these mountains of, of Bashan, uh, they're northwest of the Sea of Galilee. They're actually much higher than Jerusalem is in elevation. And what does it say about them, even though they're higher in elevation? Um, Zion's beauty is greater. Bashan and those mountains and Mount Zalman, they're even thinking 
looking jealously at, at Mount uh, Zion there in Jerusalem. Why? Well, the Lord chose to dwell there in, in Jerusalem, in Sinai, uh, not in Sinai, in Zion with, with the temple and with the ark. Um, and some of that, the glory portrayed by the chariots of God, uh, thousands upon thousands and two times 10,000. Um, and that the Lord in, in his glory has come up from Sinai to his sanctuary. That, so verse 17 we see that picture again that the whole psalm carries out of God marching in, in the temple and in the Ark of the Covenant with the Israelites all the way from Sinai into the promised land and ultimately in the days of David take up residence in, in Jerusalem. Um, verse 18 might sound familiar. And if you see the, the notes there on the right that the uh, you ascended on high, you led captivity captive, you received gifts among men. Uh, Ephesians 4 actually quotes verse 18, but not related to uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant entering into Jerusalem. Uh, verse 18 actually talks about Christ's ascension. So we have a messianic verse here, you ascended on high. What did that do? It was marked the completion of uh, God's conquest uh, of sin, death, and the devil, and the devil leading captivity captive. So that in that phrase, if you catch that that talk, uh, captivity to sin. So our captors, sin, death, and the devil. What happened to them? They became uh, our, the captors were taken captive uh, in, in a way that they they were arrested. And that means that we go free from our captivity to them. Um, and interesting that in the Hebrew here, you receive gifts among men. Uh, the Septuagint, that Greek translation of the New Testament, actually says you gave gifts to men. You gave gifts among men. And, and that Greek translation is what Paul follows in Ephesians 4. Um, and that stresses the application that, that he blesses us with the abilities. You know, Christ Jesus ascended into heaven. He's, he's no longer on earth, but what has he done? He's given gifts to his people, and especially those gifts to, to people who serve him in the, in the preaching and, and teaching ministry um, that we all have gifts to use, but, but especially here, he's, he's left uh, people to, to share that word, that we all use those gifts to... Uh, join in his work. And what is that work? That the rebellious, uh, that even among the rebellious, the Lord God might dwell, those people who were enemies, well, God might dwell among them as they come to faith. Uh, the little footnote there here on Lord, um, it just indicates that that isn't the Yahweh, the, the entire four letters of that title of the Lord. It's just the first two letters of it. So it's just Yah. Like, like uh, we have in hallelujah, a little bit of abbreviated thing. Um, not that, just interesting to note, not that there's much to uh, uh, dig into more deeply about that. Questions about this uh, reference to the ascension here, uh, connecting that ascension to, uh, to this whole section of the, the ark going up to Jerusalem or any comments anyone has? So as I'm going through this, I'm coming up with all, maybe I'll follow through on it, maybe not, on, on a lot of sermon themes or sermon texts as we're walking through all of the Psalms. So, oh yeah, this would be a really good Psalm to uh, to preach on, on, on this certain day of the year, this certain festival. And um, I haven't preached too much on the Psalms in the past, but doing a Bible study uh, on that might be whetting my appetite for it. Um, a short little verse 19, but it's a special verse. Uh, I, I, very intriguing and, and neat for me. Uh, Sue, would you like to read verse 19 for us? Blessed be the Lord. Day by day, he bears our burdens. He is the God who saves us. So yeah, a, a little prayer, very short. Blessed be the Lord, and but summarizing all God does for us. And, and why do you think I shared... Uh, that how do those three lines in a way summarize all god does for us yeah 
Yeah, Carol, go ahead. Well, to me, it just it 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 just continues. It it does both things. It brings it down to the very minute of the day and the age itself that he will always be with us. It, yeah. There isn't any break in it. Yeah, no, no break. Day by day, bearing our burdens. Wow, um, he walks with us every day. He he doesn't just say, "Oh, hang out on earth for." For 50, 60, 80 years, and, and then you'll get to heaven, right? Uh, our Lord goes with us today, and 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 sometimes, uh, I know, especially early in my ministry, and really try to avoid it now. I would get to these problems and say, "Oh, just wait till we get to heaven," and and you don't want to ignore this truth that day by day he, he's with us, that day by day he he bears those burdens, but then ultimately um, he does save us, and so. Part of the fact that we live day by day and he bears our burdens, that also would mean nothing if we didn't have the eternal victory as well. Uh, Sue, something to add? Um, just wondering if that first line, blessed be the Lord, can be a bit of a thanks. Thanks be to God um, for, for doing this day by day and for saving us. Yeah, blessed be the Lord. It's one of the ways to say thank you to him. It's one of the ways, another one of the ways to praise him. Uh, blessed um, is when we speak well of somebody. And, and there's a difference between when we bless the Lord and he blesses us. Because uh, I think of the Star Trek uh, Captain Picard phrase, make it so. Um, when the Lord blesses us, he makes it so. He makes it that way. He gives us those good things. When we bless the Lord, we just get to join in in speaking the truth that already exists. We, we aren't Captain Picard. We, we don't make it so. Maybe a, a, a pop culture reference that might even date me or might not be reference available for you. But uh, it, get that point. We don't make it so. The Lord already is when we bless him. And, and that is praising. That is thanking him as well. Sue, a follow up on that? Oh, I was just going to say, so in three lines, it really covers it all. It's a, it's a thank you, um, it's an appreciation, and it's a reminder to us um, yes, in the yeah. short term and in the long term. Yeah, very, very true. Um, and so maybe, maybe another one of those, if you're taking notes on, on sections of, of the Psalms to well, highlight in yellow in your Bible, that to say, hey, this is a good one to memorize or at least come back to. Uh, a short little verse, uh, not too difficult to memorize. Uh, Carol, something to add? Only that <clears throat> uh, the reference you made before, sometimes it's a, it's a big, obvious miracle that affects a lot of people. But most of the time, it's just a day, day by day. There are so many miracles in our lives that probably even go unnoticed. But he's always working, even in, in subtle ways. Nothing specific comes to mind now, uh, other than my aha moments, the knowing that God is working in my life. But it, 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 it is so awesome. And then you, when you made the comment about um, when we are having difficulties and, and sin is present and whatever is going on in our life is making us realize it's not going to ever be much better in this life we still have the joy of salvation even here with all the troubles going on yes we look forward to heaven but when we when we say like the prayer from Philippians to rejoice always we truly can't because the rejoicing is the promise yeah, very very good uh, well said um, to have that blessing of our care and I'm going to segue that in that, that blessing and that joy we have segue that into again uh, part of our victory means defeat of God's enemies and, and actually a rather graphic picture of that coming up a horrible devastating defeat of the enemies um niles would you mind reading verses 20 through 23 our god is a god who saves from god the lord comes escape from death 
Surely God will crush the heads of his enemies, the scalps of those who walk around in their guilt. The Lord says, I will bring them from Bashan. I will bring them from the depths of the sea so that you may stomp your foot in blood. The tongues of your dogs get their share of the enemy's blood. They see your possession, O God, the possessions of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. The singers lead the way. After them come the musicians. In the middle are virgins playing hand drums. In the assemblies, bless God the Lord, who is the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin leading them. The officers of Judah are their noisy crowd. There are the officers of Zebulun and the officer of Naphtali. These future victories, thank you, Niles, um, really ha ha include that defeat of the enemies. And the God, our God is a God who saves. I'm not going to read all the way through the, the, the graphic per portrayals of, of the blood and the dogs even drinking the blood and the uh, but we have this devastating defeat that God brings on his enemies, but it points especially to the judgments of hell and, and very much an understatement, not a, not a pretty picture here. And, but that's because hell is not a pretty place. Um, and even if you think of how horrible that is, that dogs would be getting their share and, and scavenging the, the enemy's blood, uh, the most horrible pictures we imagine of, of from earthly life to, to get a picture of hell, a, a pale reflection of how terrible uh, hell uh, being defeated by God truly is. Um, and in some way it takes us back to uh, the book of Revelation that we studied uh, a little over a year ago here as, as well. So then um, God's procession in the temple as Niles read that this is really getting the whole heart there. We, we, we no longer have that review of of the history marching through the desert entering the promised land and that protection of god now we actually see um the ark of the covenant going into jerusalem uh, the sanctuary that procession where we have singers leading the way musicians uh, the, the, the virgins the, the young women uh, playing the drums involved as well the assemblies blessing god uh, the fountain of israel the one who gives them their strength um, and source. Uh, we have a number of tribes mentioned here. Uh, you'll recognize Benjamin, I think, uh, Judah, and Zebulun, and Naphtali. Um, the comment that I have in, in my notes to the right there is that these are four, and, and Levi is not mentioned, right? Uh, so these four represent the, uh, the lay people of Israel, and, and they're joining in the procession in, in the joy. Uh, why is Benjamin little? Um, Benjamin was little because he was the youngest. Uh, we remember that as well. Um, and he was also oftentimes uh, considered the, the, you know, one of the smallest of the tribes in number as well. Um, so that, uh, yeah, so Benjamin, Benjamin is also maybe taken out and mentioned particularly because a Jerusalem was originally given as an inheritance of the promised land to, to Benjamin. That Benjamin, uh, the land that Benjamin received included the, the capital city of Jerusalem, where ultimately uh, it's now known as part of, of Judah. Uh, comments or questions on, on those two sections, those victories and the, that procession into the temple? So we have a, a prayer for future victory. Uh, Sue, question? Well, just a thought that popped into my head. Um, if um, when the, the parts of, of the promised land were assigned and um, the Jerusalem area was assigned to Benjamin, which was a smaller, younger tribe, um, you know, Benjamin, smaller, younger, does that maybe picture that even the least of people are um, included in the um, the uh, inheritance of the kingdom of God yeah yeah there, we, if, can, we can see that Jerusalem was chosen for for Benjamin's tribe yeah and there's a couple of neat things that we can take from that history um, not not um, just learning from from the evidence of the past uh, one of them being Benjamin a smaller tribe and in effect over time 
that their land, while not their, their birthright and their descendants, there's uh, in a lot of ways they maintain their, their descendancy from the tribe of Benjamin, but their land really intermingled with Judah. And Benjamin having that happen is actually a lot better than being, being unique in its own state in next to the, the northern 10 tribes, right? Um, because Benjamin benefited from being uh, connected to Judah. Why? Because the northern tribes were carried off into captivity. You know, so that being little actually was a blessing that God used for Benjamin. Then the other one, Simeon, uh, one, of the, one of the stronger tribes at the beginning of the march through the desert, um, they were much smaller by the time they entered Jerusalem, and they actually received and uh, entered the promised land. They actually received land to the south of Judah, and their tribe was really wound up totally merging with Benjamin. But again, not with Benjamin, with Judah. And that again was a blessing that rather than celebrate their uniqueness and being their own state, um, that they, and they got so, so much merged up into Judah that we have the two tribes in the, or two tribes in the south and the 10 to the north that Simeon kind of just totally didn't even get counted anymore. Um, but it was a blessing because those descendants of Simeon, again, were part of Judah, and they had the captivity of Babylon and returned, unlike the northern tribes carried off by Assyria. So yeah, a lot can, uh, can go, go into that. So good thoughts. Um, Sue, would you mind reading? Uh, I think we're up to reading uh, verses 28, another a little prayer for future victory, but go ahead and take us to the bottom of the page, verse 34. Okay. Your God commands your strength. Show strength, O God, as you have done for us before. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring tribute to you. Threaten the, the beast among the reeds, the herd, of the, bull, the herd of bulls among the calves, that is the peoples, until they submit with bars of silver. He scatters the peoples who delight in battles. Envoys will come from Egypt. Cush will run for, to stretch out its hands to God. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Make music to the Lord, to him who rides in the highest heavens, in the ancient heavens. Yes, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Proclaim God's strength. His majesty is over Israel, and his power is in the skies. So yeah, the prayer for God to grant future victories, uh, just like he did in the past, the confidence in that. Can, some, some neat pictures here that God rules the nations, that, that God has control of the beast among the reeds. Uh, might be the hippopotamus, as I mentioned in my notes, another commentator suggested the crocodile. But because of the reeds and the water, we think of the Egyptian, the Nile River Delta. And so it, it, that can re represent uh, Egypt, one of the strongest nations um, uh, of the day, and even through through the time when the David's kingdom continued, Egypt grew in power again. Uh, but then strong bulls and calves, uh, those can be other nations as well, both the, the strong and the weak. What happens? Well, they submit to God's power as well, um, so that uh, Egypt and Cush, which is south of Egypt, what do they do? They actually come to the Lord as well that uh, they, they join in this praise uh, by becoming God's people. And, and if you know about church history, Egypt became, uh, and Alexandria became one of the chief places in the, in the early centuries after Christ, uh, one of the chief places of, of, and heartbeats, uh, heartbeds of Christianity. Uh, Egypt rivaled uh, the, you know, Asia Minor and even Constantinople for quite some time as, as a, you know, an enemy country that then, yeah, submitted to the gospel and became a follower of Christ. Uh, we have a brief closing praise here in verse 35. You are awesome, O God, from your sanctuary. The God of Israel, he is the one who gives power and strength to the people. Blessed be God. And it summarizes God's relationship to his people throughout history. And we, we join in that praise. Kind of wraps up the thoughts I had to share. Any questions that you have on recent comments or anything from the 
the, the entire psalm to this Psalm 68. Okay, let's jump in then and get into Psalm 69 and we'll see how we, we march through this one as well. Um, Prayer of an Innocent Sufferer, Save Me. It's matched only by Psalm 22 in this graphic picture of the suffering Messiah. Frequently quoted in the New Testament, obviously Psalm 69 becomes then a messianic psalm for the choir director, the tune According to the Lilies by David. Um, Niles, would you take uh, the first two sections here, uh, verses one through four? Save me, O God, <clears throat> for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink into the deep mud where there is no place to stand. I have entered deep waters and the rapids rush over me. I am worn out from my crying, my throat is sore, my eyes are blurry as I wait for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs on my head. Those who want to destroy me, my lying enemies are strong. I must repay things I did not steal. So the, the section, the deep, deep, mud, deep, mid, deep water and deep mud, that is symbolizes trouble that's too big for believers to overcome by themselves. We have to wait for God, but they also can in some way uh, foreshadow Christ's urgent prayers in Gethsemane and on the cross. Um, even as the Messiah, he, he waited on the Lord. He went to the Lord for strength and in his prayers spoke to God. Um, verse 4 that you read, that those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head, they're, they're all around me. Um, that's quoted by Jesus himself in John chapter 15, uh, describing Jesus' enemies. Yeah, he, he was good. He did miracles. He was kind. He did wonderful things. And, and how did they repay? How did they respond? to those good things Jesus did, though they hated him. They didn't have any reason to do that. And even Pilate admitted that he found no basis for the charge uh, against, against Christ Jesus. Uh, so is there any comments, questions on these first uh, four verses here of, of Psalm 69, this messianic psalm? Sue, please. Um, even without the discussion, the first thoughts I had when Niles read those verses was, um, Jesus crying out um, to God about his, uh, the people who are uh, surrounding him, hating him, threatening him, killing him. It's just, it's just there. It, it, you can't miss it. Yeah. It, it, and really, sometimes the, those messianic psalms, you say, how is that messianic? But this one, you read it through it, and, and it's one of those easier places to see Christ especially 69 uh, some psalms in, into the study of it uh, where I think we're kind of learning to look for those places where we can see Christ and, and then it really stands out for us. But yeah, excellent comment. Glad you saw that from, from the beginning. Uh, Carol, you want to continue here to a little bit longer section of verses 5 through 12, his guilt and shame. Sure. God, you know my folly, and my guilt is not hidden from you. May those who place their confidence in you not be put to shame because of me, O Lord, the Lord of armies. May those who seek you not be disgraced because of me, O God of Israel. It is for your sake that I bear scorn. Shame covers my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, a foreigner to my mother's son, sons. Yes, zeal for your house consumes me. The scorn of those who scorn you falls on me. I wept as I fasted, but this only brought insults to me. When I wore sackcloth as my clothing, I was a joke to them. Those who sit in the gatehouse gossip about me, and the songs of the drunks are about me. The guilt and shame of the Messiah, I think we can easily and quickly see the Messiah talking and about his guilt. And we say, oh yeah, well, obviously the Messiah has guilt. Um, he didn't commit any sin, but he was indeed a sinner before God's judgment um, because our guilt was transferred to him. So we can see that word guilt being applied to the Messiah actually saying, I have that guilt. A folly might be a little more difficult. 
how how was the Messiah foolish? Um, we could take that same picture of how our foolishness is placed on him, but I, it's something even bigger comes to mind when you think about that folly or foolishness um, from 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, that chapter talks about the foolishness of God, right? Uh, that foolishness of God is the cross of Christ, that God would would rescue us by having his son die rather than letting us pull ourselves up from our own bootstraps and give us the ability to do it. Um, grace is, 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 is folly in the eyes of the world. Uh, and then with this folly in the eyes of the world, we, we pray that we will not be ashamed because of Jesus. That just as the Messiah prays about us, those who trust in God, don't be ashamed because of me and, and my cross. Um, you know, that, that's kind of what the Apostle Paul in Romans 1 also brings to mind. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ uh, because it might appear folly, but it is actual power of God for salvation. So questions or comments on, on those words of folly or guilt and, and the Messiah? Yeah. Jesus did endure the shame in so many ways throughout, not just at the cross, but throughout his earthly life, rejected by his family. Uh, his brothers and mother thought him, thought he was a lunatic for a while. They were going to get him to stop doing what he was doing, going about preaching and getting the, the Pharisees and the leaders of the Jews mad at him. And then verse 9, zeal for your house consumes me. Uh, you can recognize that uh, quoted, uh, probably, you recognize that quoted by, by John's Gospel, chapter 2, with the first temple cleansing. The disciples remembered this psalm, and oh yeah, this talks about the Messiah and how Jesus is fulfilling that. Um, so that verse, first half of verse 9 is quoted in John 2, and, and verse, the second half of verse 9, again, a messianic quote, brought up in Romans 15, the scorn of those who scorn you falls on me. Uh, it really just connects Christ's willingness to suffer and obey the Father's will, that he was willing to receive uh, the scorn that uh, people had for God. Uh, any other questions about this picture? Uh, maybe, maybe verses 11 and 12, I don't have a note on it, but the mm -hmm. gossip and the joking and the mockery all of that that uh, Jesus uh, received uh, as he was on the cross. Uh, Sue? Um, even though it's messianic, is um, and this is by David, so David is sort of talking about himself here a bit too? Um, I, I think this one is so clearly messianic that it might apply in part. I mean, David was mocked and uh, it's at times in his life when he had to flee from Saul or Absalom, um, having to, but I think that, uh, that this one is so clearly messianic, we don't have to say it, a partial fulfillment or description of David's life. Um, I, I think this one, like you said, it just jumps out of us the whole psalm all the way through. This is talking about the Messiah. And yes, you can see things that do apply so to David as well. But the intent is a messianic prophecy. So then, this is this is almost this is prophetic. Then it is God speaking yes. through him as a prophet. Well, yeah, David is speaking as a prophet for God, talking about the coming Messiah, and and, and right. we call this a direct prophecy, uh, rather than the prophecy with an intermediate fulfillment. Uh, that long term, it would be described, you know, thinking of David having his son build a house for God. You know, he was talking about the intermediate fulfillment, that half fulfillment that Solomon would, would be for the prophecy when he built the temple in Jerusalem. That was intermediate or halfway fulfillment. It was fully fulfilled when Christ completed the work uh, of salvation by giving us a dwelling with God in heaven. So, so again, this one would be the direct prophecy, not partial fulfillment uh, in David's life, but directly talking about Christ. I think most, most commentators would see this as direct. 
Okay, I'm going to go on uh, verses 13 uh, to 18. Uh, Sue, would you mind reading? Um, I got lost making some notes. 13 to 18? Yes, please. Okay. But I direct my prayers to you, O Lord, for a time of favor. God, in the greatness of your mercy, answer me with the certainty of salvation from you. Rescue me from the mud so I do not sink. Let me escape from those who hate me and from the deep waters. Do not let the rapids rush over me. Do not let the deep swallow me up. Do not let the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, Lord, for your mercy is good. According to your great compassion, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant, because I am in distress. Hurry, answer me. Come near, redeem my soul. Ransom me because of my enemies. Yeah, the, the Messiah is uh, great suffering. We have an interruption here because that suffering is going to be described in the future. But we have uh, that prayer for deliverance, uh, that trusting prayer. And it, it includes three points. The, the deepness, the mud, the rapids. The greatness of his affliction is there. We have the, the, the scorn, the bitter hatred of his enemies. But then also that while we have that, we have that goodness, the mercy of God. Uh, all three of those things are, are come through in, in this prayer. Uh, we could also see that that trusting nature here as he's praying to God, redeem me. And again, that beautiful word, buy me back, buy back my soul from sin. Uh, uh, and, um, and we can even see that applying to, to the Messiah. Um, because, yeah, he, he was guilty for carrying our sins. And the thing is with the Messiah that he himself paid the price uh, for all of that sin and all of that guilt. He paid that price for, for entire, the entirety of redemption. Comments, questions on that interlude of prayer? Um, Niles, would you take verses 19 through 28? So it'll be a couple of sections here, his shame and his curse. You know my disgrace, my shame, and my confusion. All my foes are in front of you. <clears throat> disgrace has broken my heart and I am helpless. I waited for sympathy, but there was none. <clears throat> I waited for comforters, but I did not find any. Instead, they put bitter poison in my food. From my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. May the table set before them become a snare. May it be a trap to them and their allies. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. Make their legs always tremble. Pour out your wrath on them. Let the heat of your anger catch up with them. May their camp be desolate. May there be no one dwelling in their tents, for they pursue those who you have disciplined, O God, and they talk about the pain of those you wound. Add guilt to their guilt. Do not let them enter into your righteousness. May they be erased from the book of life. May they not be listed among the righteous. We have that shame of the Messiah there. Um, obvious fulfillment here, disgrace, shame, confusion, the foes uh, are, are there. Um, again, obvious fulfillment in, in the gospel accounts of, of Jesus uh, suffering. He was alone. Um, and they put bitter poison in his food. Um, many translators, translations here where poison is used, uh, many translations say gall. Sour wine is another term here. These translators say sour wine, but it's really vinegar, um, another word for it. So Matthew 27 ha has indications of, of, of this fulfillment uh, of these words of messianic prophecy. Um, and that, that shame of the Messiah then leads to that prayer, the curse uh, from the Messiah, uh, and really, it's a horrifying prayer that the enemies be condemned to hell. Uh, nothing less than damnation for Christ's enemies. And, and this is the imprecatory nature of the Psalms. Um, we've discussed that to some degree. Uh, obviously, you do want God's enemies to repent. But when they do not repent, they have rejected every measure of every way to receive God's grace. Uh, there is nothing left 
for God to do except condemn them. His holiness uh, uh, requires it. And so the imprecatory nature, I say, does not contradict a father forgive them what Jesus prayed for the cross. And especially then, um, uh, verse 25, the, in Acts chapter 1, when they considered, you know, what do we do with uh, the vacant spot in the 12 apostles? Um, they applied verse 25, may their camp be desolate, to, to Judas um, and how he had closed his heart to God's love. He wound up placing himself under this curse of God's law. And what happened to Judas? Uh, he was erased from, from the book of life. And, and we, we can really take home from that the words from Mark chapter 16, 15, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But at the same verse, right, whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these verses really talk about the severity of that condemnation. Uh, questions about the imprecatory thoughts or the curse or any of this shame that we have. Sue, please. Um, back in verse 20, where it says, disgrace has broken my heart. Um, I, I, the words broken my heart, it, it's the human nature of Jesus. It just makes you hurt for how, even though he wanted to die for us, he wanted us to go to heaven, how it must have hurt every time he was rejected, um, every time he was um, scorned, uh, every time he, uh, every time someone wanted to hurt him or kill him. It, it, the human aspect there just got to me. Yeah, yeah, very good point. That that's, that stands out. That takes takes that uh, very emotional comment about a heartbreak, right? And. and you see that, uh, that humanity of Christ. All right, a closing prayer as we wrap it up. A carol, would you take verses 29 to 36, please? Sure. His closing prayer. But I am afflicted and in pain. Oh God, may salvation from you set me on high. I will praise God's name in song. I will proclaim his greatness with thanksgiving. For the Lord, this is better than an ox, than a bull that has horns and hoofs. The poor will see and be glad. You who seek God, may your hearts live. For the Lord listens to the needy, and he does not despise the captives who belong to him. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and all that move in them. For God will save Zion, and he will build the cities of Judah. Then people will settle there and possess it. Then the descendants of his servants will inherit it, and those who love his name will dwell in it. So that salvation, in that closing prayer, um, the Messiah, is is confident that that pain will end. Uh, the resurrection, the Easter, is, is on the other side, and, and he will join in that praise of, amongst the living. Um, so it's beyond the, the opening prayer in some ways that we started with this psalm, an opening prayer for rescue from the suffering, rescue from the deep waters. Uh, now going to the deliverance at the final victory um, which takes us not only to Easter, but also to Judgment Day and eternity with God, and God wanting us to join in that praise. Um, and and we, we see the poor, the, the lonely, the needy, the captives, they join in that, and, and just that neat concept. We, we replace the Messiah who is lonely, abandoned, and suffering, and now he's got a good crowd of others joining in the joy and the praise um, of those who believe, um, and means that that victory that he has, it's our victory as well. We, we join in that praise. Uh, thoughts, comments, questions on this section? Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Carol, please. Well, in, uh, in uh, verses 30 and 31, this is directly related to the end of sacrificing because now the final sacrifice has been made. No more 
bloody sacrifices. So we can rejoice that that part of the Old Testament is closing and the New Testament is beginning and it's so it's the joy of the gospel. Yeah, one wonderful comment there that, that that's God's intent all along. Wasn't that uh, sacrifices of animals was the, the end game, right? No, it was our praise, our, our entire being belonging to him. And he fulfilled those sacrifices by being a sacrifice for us. Sue, comments? Um, just that when you, when, when I saw the word poor right away, I was thinking the lowest of us humans, the neediest of us, the loneliest of us all have uh, the hope, um, the security and knowing that um, the uh, salvation has already been won. Yeah, what wonderful, wonderful comment. Uh, and um, it can take us to the, the, the Beatitudes, right? Um, Blessed are the poor at heart, for they will see God. The uh, great and the meek, and 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 all of those blessings that God gives, and and we have a part of not because we earned or deserved it, but because of His grace. And again, His victory is, is our victory uh, as well. Uh, why don't we uh, end then? Uh, unless there are any other comments, we'll we'll close uh, our study today with with words of prayer. Uh, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God's blessings to you, and we will uh, look forward.